Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night in the Word here at New Life Christian Assembly. I'm Pastor Rick, and uh, I'll be with you, Lord willing, for the next hour or so, finishing up. Everyone say, finishing up. At least, <laughs> hopefully finishing up Daniel, the uh, last chapter, chapter 12. Uh, so how's everyone doing? Beautiful day today. As they say, beautiful day in the neighborhood. Hello, James Carter. Good to see you, my friend. Hello, uh, Julie. Uh, <coughs> Julie, how, how are you? Um, so there's Jerry, Julie, uh, Jeannie. Uh, uh, I forget right now. Joyce. All the Ellis family there. So good to see you there, Julie. Tony, good to see you. Uh, Tony will be sharing the word uh, tomorrow night at the men's Zoom meeting at 7 o'clock. Guys, you're more than welcome to join us. Hey, Pamela, good to see you here. Jerry Ellis and Ginny Ellis, God bless you. So good to have you. <clears throat> uh, okay, Jan. Wait a minute. Julie, uh, Julie, Jan, and Joyce, and Jerry, and Jeannie. There you go. Hey, David Brissett, good to see you here. Okay, Alan Martino, how you doing, my brother? All right. Okay, just say, uh, Pauline, good to see you. God bless you. Uh, Danica, good to see you. Uh, let's see, Sandy Whitney, God bless you, Sandy. Good to see you. And Sandy, thank you for always responding to my emails. I really do appreciate that. Uh, Maleta, good to see you. Uh, okay, no rush to, well, in that case, we may go a few extra, no, I'm only kidding. There's, there's just so much in the book of Daniel. I mean, tonight you're going to see, we got to verse number nine last Wednesday. <clears throat> so we have nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, <clears throat> but I want to rehash some of it because there's more, I, I left out some stuff last week. So I want to get back into that anyway. All right. Uh, who we got else we got here? All right. Well, good to see you. Please hit your share button. I see 16 people on here right now. We've been averaging around 20 or so. I would love to hit 30. I mean, just for the sake of it. If everyone hit your share button, maybe that would happen. I don't know. Is it worth a shot? I mean, I just I just love uh, getting the word out there. And uh, let me just say this before we get started. Uh, the Word of God, I, I was going to end the lesson by talking about the, what, the word of, what the Word of God says about the Word of God. But the Word of God says about the Word of God that the Word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's profitable for teaching and for correction <coughs> that the man or woman of God may be complete, lacking in nothing. Uh, the Word of God is like a hammer. The Word of God is like a light. It's like a lamp. So even though... There may not be anything you may think like directly related to your life as we study the book of Daniel. Just the simple fact that we're studying the word of God will have an impact on our soul, on our being. And uh, having that word in our spirit <coughs> will in the long run <coughs> um, benefit us and help us along the way. Excuse me while I break off a piece of this little thing. I think I'm allergic to something in the office. I'm fine all day long, but I come over here and I start to cough a little bit. All right, so anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, we're going to pray for a few people, a few situations, and then a quick, some quick announcements, then get into the Word. Dear Father, <coughs> Lord God, thank you for uh, Wednesday night in the Word. We pray your blessing over our time together. We welcome your Holy Spirit to bless our fellowship and to enlighten our heart and our mind and our spirit <clears throat> to the things that we'll be talking about in the Word tonight. Father, we do want to thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Even though we may fail you, you never fail us. Thank you that your mercies are new every single morning, and we uh, rejoice in that. Lord, we do want to lift up our sister Joanne Feldman tonight. <clears throat> I want to pray for her uh, physical health, her uh, psychological health, her legal status. Lord, just touch her, provide for her what's necessary in her life. 
Let her be getting the help that she needs in the name and authority of Jesus. We pray, Lord, for Adrian Velez for healing of cancer. We pray uh, a, a thank you prayer that he got out to Texas safely, <clears throat> where he's going to continue treatments. But Lord, bless Adrian, heal his body, strengthen him, body, soul, and spirit, and uh, let him be a blessing to his family at this time. We pray, Lord, for Eva Rogers for just continued healing of her <clears throat> lungs, of pneumonia, of her heart, <clears throat> of any medication she's taking. Let it work well in her body. Just strengthen our dear sister and let her be well in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for Angela. We pray for Alinda. We pray for Christine, um, our online sisters from Worcester, from Virginia, from Colorado. Lord, just bless them physically emotionally, spiritually, fill them, Lord, with peace, and uh, <coughs> Lord, meet um, the needs that are represented there. Father, we lift up Lisa Jones to you and family as they deal with COVID. We pray for divine healing and strength in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, for Doreen, just for your blessing upon her life physically, spiritually, emotionally. We pray, Lord, for marriages to be strengthened and encouraged. <clears throat> we pray for children's salvation in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, for anyone uh, dealing with uh, difficulties with finances, that your provision would be there. We pray, Lord, for the ministries at New Life, in particular, kids' ministry and uh, youth ministry. Lord, we pray for both of these ministries to really, really take off, <clears throat> to be a blessing to many, many people in our community. We pray for leaders to rise up, especially in the area of youth ministry. We pray, Lord, for the men's and women's ministries as well, uh, especially coming up this weekend. So, Lord, we give you praise. We give you all the glory and honor. We welcome your Holy Spirit, Lord, to just to, <clears throat> just to teach us tonight what we need to know. But we bless you, we honor you, we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, as far as announcements go, there's a Brotherhood Zoom meeting tomorrow night, Thursday night, at 7 o'clock. Uh, Pastor Wayne will be in charge of that. And uh, Tony Casina will be uh, sharing the word. So that's great. Thank you, Tony, for doing that. Uh, this Friday is our sisterhood meeting. Uh, in the church sanctuary at 6.30. All the ladies are invited to come. Pamela will be sharing a special message. So uh, please come on out for some time of fellowship. I've been thinking about a, a, new, a new phrase or a saying I could put on the church sign out front. Uh, right now it's, it still says Happy Mother's Day, but I need to change that probably tomorrow. I'm thinking about the saying, isn't it about time to get back to church? Jesus is waiting, something to that effect. But I think, I think that is my theme lately. Isn't it about time to get back to church? If you can. Uh, we uh, did a little research, actually. and Because um, we've been toying with the idea, um, are, are, are people online that uh, could be in church? And you know what? I really don't think, I mean, Wednesday night, we're not in church anyway, so I'm not counting Wednesday. But Sunday morning, uh, I forget what the numbers are. We've been averaging anywhere from, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 to 20 or 25 on a Sunday morning. Uh, but um, <laughs> it's been time to get back to church. Well, yes, that's right. But anyway, I, I don't think that we're, that there are any people locally that are not coming to church because they're online. I don't think that's the case. I think there's people online that live out of town uh, that feel close to us and we appreciate that and we love that and I'm so happy for that. Uh, there's some locally that may be, you know, sickly or, you know, not able to come and that's what it's there for. Uh, but I don't think that's the reason why our attendance is being affected. Everything I read about churches uh, in, in America, I, I haven't really checked about other parts of the world, it's probably true, but every church is still reeling from the whole COVID situation. Not that COVID's a problem, right? Although there is a family in our church dealing with COVID right now, but um, it's not that, it, that it's so debilitating like it used to be in the beginning. It's more of the fact that after two years of, of COVID, 
protocol, the, our lifestyle has changed. I, I realize my lifestyle has changed. And people are less prone to get up and get out of the house on a Sunday morning and go to church. Well, they may get up and do something else on a Sunday morning, but they're not so apt to come to church like they were before. Um, now, last Sunday was Mother's Day, and uh, I think several of our people were out with their moms and with their families, which is perfectly understandable. Uh, but you know what? A few years ago, um, every Mother's Day was very well attended in most churches, and uh, families made it a point to get into the house of the Lord first and then do something afterwards or before. Um, now, we're starting church at 10 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, we think that's a good move. Uh, this gives us, I mean, if anyone wanted to go out for breakfast, there's still time to do that and then get to church by 10 o'clock. And if you wanted to go out for lunch by, you know, 12.30 or so, 10.30, 10, 11, 11.30, we're usually done by 12 the latest, I think. But, you know, if you wanted to go out for lunch after that, I mean, that, that would be fine too. I'm just saying, I think our culture has changed and church hasn't, uh, become or, or, or church has it maintained its importance like it used to be. Hello, Rob uh, La Fountain out in Illinois. God bless you. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, just talking about people, um, uh, Rob, uh, attending church online, and that's great, uh, but we're trying to push the local community to get back into church. Uh, let's see, James was saying something. We have never stopped, even. even with the government shutdown, no, you know we've always been open one way or the other. Um, oh, Stacy's here. Hi, Stacy on New Life Haverhill. Uh, Stacy, thinking about a theme for the sign out front. About time to get back to church, with a question mark. Jesus is waiting. Uh, let's see. Sandy was saying something. Uh, it gets very convenient to be sitting on your couch watching for the word, but you have to get back. Yeah, it's true. Yep, there's nothing like being in the house of the Lord. Hey, Lisa, good to see you. You see, there you go. That's a good testimony. Well, I love going to church. I, I love going to church. I love, you know, meeting people and uh, sensing the excitement of people. I love worshiping with other people and making a big, loud sound of praise to God. And, you know... Uh, if I wasn't a pastor, I'd be in church, let me tell you. I, I would guarantee you, I would be in church. Okay, Julie says, I'm at a higher risk, but this Sunday coming, I'll be back at my home church. All right, great. Uh, yeah, well, you see, if you have a health problem, you know, you, you know, people have extenuating circumstances, and that's perfectly acceptable, whatever you decide to do. I'm talking about people that, you know, they're very capable of getting up and getting into the house of the Lord, but... I don't know that they're online either. I don't know what they're doing. It just makes the church mandate so much more important because you know we need to be praying for people. We need to be witnessing to people, sharing our life story, inviting people to church, etc., etc. I better stop talking so I can start teaching. How's that? Okay, let's go to uh, Daniel chapter 12. We prayed, we talked, and everything... Uh, I like the 10 a.m. service because I'm behind you guys. And our service here starts at 10. <laughs> so you could join our service at your 9 o'clock time and go to your service at 10. All right. All right. Who is this now? Tori, Tony. Well, good to see you. Saying hello to Aunt Julie. All right. Very good. Okay, uh, you know what, I have to stop looking at all the comments so I, I can get going here. Okay, chapter 12 of Daniel. It starts out, at that time. The time is, going to chapter 1145, the time of calamity. The time of, I would call it World War III, although I can't really say that, but it seems to me like it will be some type of World War calamity. Hey, Annie, good to see you. Um, at that, because you know, verse 45 says uh, the Antichrist, you know, t will, will plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountains. 
he shall come to this he shall come to his end and no one will help him but if you look above it uh, at verse 40 uh, Egypt is involved right uh, that's the king of the south the king of the north is Syria in verse 41 of uh, the glorious land is involved that's Israel and then uh, you have Edom and Moab and the prominent people of Amman I looked that up just to make sure but those areas are the present-day uh, country of Jordan uh, Jordan right now is a city of a uh, is this country of 11 million people it borders on Asia Africa and Europe it's to the east of Israel um, and it's bordered by listen to this Saudi Arabia Syria Iraq and the West Bank of Israel and the Dead Sea it's 97 percent Muslim by the way um, and then you have let's see what else we have here in verse 43 you have um, you have the countries of Egypt which is the uh, king of the south the Libyans Ethiopians those are the African nations uh, North Africa East Africa uh, so you have all these countries involved then you have uh, news from the east and from the north you have China and Russia you have all these nations involved in this tremendous calamity uh, which marks you know the beginning of the end when when Jesus will return last week we went to Revelation 19 at this point and read when Jesus intervenes but anyway chapter 12 at this time when all this is going down uh, Michael uh, the warring angel gets involved and uh, he, he'll stand up the great prince uh, who stands watch over the sons of your people that stands watch over Israel so we could say the angel Michael is watching over Israel uh, there shall be a time of trouble we talked about this from Jeremiah 30 uh, where, where it talks about Jacob's trouble um, we talked about Revelation 6 17 where this is when the Lord unleashes his wrath upon all the world by and which we are delivered from it says in Romans 5 9 we're saved from the wrath to come so hallelujah we're out of here but it is interesting to see it anyway um, and then the end of verse number one Israel is delivered whose names are written in the book we talked all about that okay now and verse number two I want to talk about this because this is this opens up a discussion uh, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life some to shame and everlasting contempt so this is one of the few references in the Old Testament regarding the resurrection of the dead and I want to I know we talked about it last week but I want to go into it a little bit deeper there's the raptured saints that will be resurrected now that would include even in this case Daniel because the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who remain will be caught up with the Lord to be with to meet him in the sky forever. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4. It, it pertains to the tribulation saints in Revelation 24 um, that uh, that get saved during the tribulation years or murdered during the and murdered, they will rise also. And then also it refers to the condemned but the condemned don't rise until the very end of those thousand years which happen after this <coughs> after the seven years of tribulation so let's go uh, to Revelation 20 verse 5 real quick Revelation 20 verse 5 because Okay, so okay. First Thessalonians four is the is the the saints, you know the the living saints, you know. That's the rapture. So there'll be a rapture before the tribulation, but at, during the tribulation, many people will get saved and will be killed. But in Revelation twenty five, it says, "Well, let's see. Maybe I don't have. Maybe it's verse four. I saw the thrones." And they, the, the saints of God, set on them. Judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus 
and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again. So see, they, he saw they those people who died, they lived again. They, they were raised. Um, now it doesn't say they were raptured, but they would have to it would have to be the same type of thing. The dead were raised. Um, so they, they lived again. But but then the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years was finished. This is called the first resurrection. So the first resurrection is the resurrection of the saints. And the first resurrection comes in two phases. The first phase is the rapture of the saints before the tribulation. The second phase of the first res resurrection is after the seven year, or right at the end of the seven year tribulation, when those martyred saints who were dead, they died, but they will be resurrected too. They will live again. So that's the first resurrection. Now this is going back to Daniel 12 too. It, it, it's pertinent. Um, because this is when a, a lot of this happens. Uh, then though, uh, let me read in Revelation 25. It says, the rest, the rest of the dead, the, the condemned dead, that would be did not live again until a thousand years was finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay. Um, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. So the second death is, a, is a, accompanied by the second resurrection. They shall be, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay, but the second death the second death will have no power over those who are a part of the first resurrection. So that, that makes sense. So let's say let's say we're raptured, and uh, you know, then the seven year tribulation comes. Those people die; they're raised up. All of us who are saved and with the Lord, the second death, which really is pertaining to the the uh, final judgment, has has no power over us. We're we're immune. We're exempt from that. Hallelujah. Um, so then it says in, in uh, back in Revelation 20 um, and 13 and 14, uh, so let's see, 11 and 12, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, that's the uh, those that were dead, without redemption i saw the dead small and great standing before god and books were open see the in, in, in daniel 12 1 the books uh indicated who was going to be saved or not but the books were open in the book of life uh the dead were judged according to their works and by the things which were written in the books the sea gave them up gave up the dead who were in it and death and hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one according to his works. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. But see, the second death has no power and no authority over those of us that were caught up in the first resurrection. So before the second death, there had to be a second resurrection. So the first resurrection is once and for all, we're out of here. Death has no, no place on us. But then there's going to be another resurrection of, of the dead, the dead, not in Christ, who will stand before God, and this will be their second death. The first death is a physical death. The second death is an eternal death and punishment. So remember the promises of Jesus. We, we who believe in, in the Lord, we have a promise of eternal, what? Life. You know, we only die physically. We don't die again. <laughs> you know, we live spiritually forever and ever. But those without Christ, they die physically, and then they die spirit. Well, not they don't die spiritually, but they die, in a sense, they die spiritually when they're cast into hell. They don't die; they're just tormented for the rest of uh, eternity. So they're dead in that sense. They're not not dead, meaning non-existent. They're existing, but they're spiritually dead, which is of 
terrible situation. But isn't that interesting? Uh, now, Jesus talked about this. Let's go to Luke 14, 4 for just a moment. I hope everyone's getting this. If you have any questions, please let me know. But Luke 14, 4, um, this is at the end of a parable. Uh, the parable of the ambitious guest. <clears throat> um, about uh, honoring the lowest and uh, not, not taking the place of honor. But anyway, it says, you will be blessed because they could not repay you because you're honoring the poor. For you will, be, you, will, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So the first resurrection is called the resurrection of the just. Isn't that nice? That sounds so good. The resurrection of the just. The unjust don't resurrect. Well, they resurrect only to be sentenced to death eternally. You see the difference? The resurrection of the just is the first resurrection. The resurrection of the unjust is the second resurrection of those that died in sin, but now they're going to be judged and they're going to die spiritually for all of eternity. Okay, then, then uh, John, John's gospel mentions it as, as well. John 5, verse number 29 we read this. Um, let me read 28 and 29. John 5, 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will bear his will hear his voice. Oh, hallelujah. And come forth, those who have done good, to the resurrection of life. Now it's called the resurrection of life. So the resurrection of the just, the resurrection of life. Um and those who have done evil, they will arise to the resurrection of condemnation. That's the second death, the second resurrection and the second death. So I just want to, you know, when you read Daniel 12 too, you could just go by quickly, but many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Um, yeah, that, that, that one verse um, it goes, goes deep into the, the, the depths of the Word of God and the wisdom of God, which has implications on the fact that Jesus came in the first place to give us eternal life so that we're not contempt, condemned for all of eternity, you know, in a lake of fire. So I, I just really appreciate the depth of the Word of God. Now you may say, well, what does that have to do with anything? You know, you're saved, you're, everything's okay. Well, you know what? Like I said before, just the fact that you know it and you have it in your spirit, you'll be better off for it. Because there, there'll, be time, there'll be days coming. You may feel discouraged or you may feel like overwhelmed or you may feel like whatever. But when you think about, you know what? Whatever happens, I'm going to be okay. And that, that in and of itself will be a blessing to you and your family because you you're standing on solid ground. Life won't shake you. Life won't, you know, knock you down and, and bowl you over. Life won't overwhelm you because you know better. You know the end of the story. You ever hear that? Christians know the end of the story. We win. Well, this is how we win. We don't win because we're so good and strong. We win because Jesus won and we associate with him. He's won the battle. So I, I really appreciate this whole thing. And I, I just had to take time to talk about it tonight. Okay, so, moving along, verse number three, uh, just a, a, a verse that, that kind of um, uh, kind of exemplifies a theme throughout the Bible that the righteous are, are living in the light, shining as stars uh, in a dark world. It's just it's analytical, it's like an analogy. Those who are wise shall shine uh, like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. So the idea is to live a godly life, a righteous life, be evangelistic in some way or another. And uh, you'll, you'll be classified as those whose light is shining. Jesus said in Matthew 5, let your, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, he also said, don't hide your light under a bushel, but let your light shine for all the world to see. So that's, that's really important. Okay, verse number four. You, Daniel, shut up the words 
sealed the book until the time of the end. We talked about this. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. I, I just wonder um, about the time of the end. You know what? I have a theory. Can't prove anything. I haven't read this anywhere. Just in my heart of hearts. I, I would remember when I first heard about the Azusa Street Revival. Now, that's a, that's a word. Uh, here, I'll write it down. A-Z-U-S-A. -S -S Street Revival. Oops. I've got all caps. Um, that Azusa Street Revival, in my mind and spirit, was, was a real uh, pivotal point in, in church life and church history because uh, I remember studying it. It was in the early 1900s. At the end of the 1800s, America was going through the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Civil War was over. Uh, a lot of movement, a lot of immigration. Everyone, you know, the country was just booming in many, many ways. Um, but there was, a, there was a lack of spirituality in most of the mainline churches. And this Azusa Street revival started in Los Angeles. Uh, it was birthed in, in Pentecost. You know what that means? It was birthed with an anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, with um, what we would call the full gospel message. The full gospel. Uh, meaning the belief of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, healings, miracles, signs and wonders, speaking in tongues, the whole deal. Um, that's, the, that's the full gospel. A lot of churches still don't preach the full gospel. They preach salvation, but they don't preach the full gospel. We are a full gospel church, by the way. But anyway, so when that happened in, what, 1906, I think it was, 1907, man, people not only got saved, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. There were white people. There were black people. There were probably other races as well and nationalities. But that, that became a hub of revival, not only in California, but over all of America. And after a year or two, people were coming from other parts of the world to come to this Azusa Street revival. And uh, it's almost like a modern day day of Pentecost from Acts chapter 2. Because in Acts chapter 2, you have all these, all these Jewish people coming from all over the region, different countries coming to Jerusalem that day to celebrate Pentecost, you know, the Old Testament Pentecost, which is the ingathering of the wheat. But now the Holy Spirit falls upon the, the 120 believers in the upper room, Acts 1 and 2, and they're all speaking in tongues, and they're filled, and they're empowered, and and Peter's preaching in 2,000, or is it 3,000? I forget right now. Uh, how can I forget that? <laughs> 3,000, sorry. 3,000 people got saved, and the church was birthed. You know, that's the, that's the birth date of the church when Pentecost fell, and, and they spoke, and, and 3,000 people got saved and baptized. Well, fast forward to like 1906, 1907, and this little revival breaks out, a very humble, no big fanfare. It wasn't anything like that. But they were preaching the same message. Peter said, what you see in here, this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel when he said, you know, in, in the last days, uh, the spirit will fall and old men will dream dreams, young men will see visions and um, um, that my spirit will fall on my men servants and my maid servants, and all these wonderful things will happen. Well, this was a renewal of that, and it happened. It happened. Uh, I think Pamela mentioned, yeah, the Assemblies of God came from that revival. That was not an Assembly of God revival, but from that came probably, I don't know, five or six years later. I forget. I forget the history of it. Maybe several years later. Uh, they, they formed a, a, a group and they, they established some criteria to safeguard the revival that was happening. And, and that was the creation of the Assemblies of God. And from that, other Pentecostal groups have started, like the Church of God, uh, the Church of God in Christ. Um, what's that other one? The one with Jack Hayford uh, out in California. I forget the name of it right now. 
Oh, four square. Uh, yeah, so there, there's several. You know, the Assemblies of God doesn't have the, the, the handle on Pentecost, believe me, but it was the first one that really got established and is still going very strong. But anyway, I'm saying, going back to this, um, knowledge shall increase. You know, uh, this, this book will be sealed until the time of the... I just wonder if during that time, because when you think about it, other things happen too. I mean, you have the you have the printing press that came out in the 1600s, but you have like the, the the major developments in communication. Newspapers were going out like crazy. Uh, the printed page was enormous. Uh, communications was happening with the telephone and radio uh, in the 50s, 40s, and 50s came TV. But you know, since the, that early 1900, 1915, 16. Man, the world has changed so, so much. It's incredible. And so from then until, and now, now throw on top of that, the computer age and, and the rate of information that's being shared now compared to what it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, it's as astronomical what's happening now. And, and so you have to wonder, is this the time of the end? And, and at the time of the end, that, that the, the book was sealed. Like, I don't know if those... You know, those New Testament saints in the first century, fifth century, tenth century, whatever. I don't know if they had a clue about the book of Daniel. I don't know. I, I never studied it. I don't know. I don't think so. But I don't really know. But all, I do know at the turn of the century, in the 1900s, all of a sudden scholars were popping out. All, and now they're all over the place uh, analyzing the prophecies. And knowledge is definitely increasing because of everything else that's been going on. It's all a work of God. At the same time, as you know, the world has fallen apart in a handbasket. People are going crazy. Countries are going crazy. Some countries are so wealthy, yet their people are starving to death. There's corruption everywhere. And, and I don't have to, have to mention all that, but Ukraine. And, and what about this tornado went through Ohio a week or so ago? picked up cars. I mean, no one ever talks about that. That's phenomenal what happened. That's got to be a sign of God doing something. When you put it all together, the calamities and the natural disasters and this and that, and the increase of knowledge and information, you have to be thinking, man, something's going on around here. And so, yeah, I have a feeling. I mean, I can't prove it. It's just my personal little thought. I think that Azusa Street Revival marks something significant in, in spiritual history. I think one day people will look back on that. Even non-Pentecostals will look back on that because really the Pentecostal movement, I don't want to be boasting about the Pentecostal movement because we're in it, but I guess I am. The Pentecostal movement uncovered a lot of stuff that was dormant for a long time in the Word of God because the Pentecostal movement was characterized by a love for the Word of God and studying the Word of God and sending people out to other nations to proclaim the Word of God. In the process of that, you better believe a lot of studying and research went on to know that, you know, to know, to be prepared what they were doing. I mean, we couldn't send people out to other nations to preach the Word of God if they didn't know the Word of God. Now, that could be another problem today because a lot of people are out proclaiming the Word of God and they don't really know it as well as they should know it. Another story right there. I don't want to get into that. But anyway, I'm just saying. Verse number 4, Daniel 12. I have a feeling that a case could be made that the end of time, until the time of the end, began in the 1900s. Well, you can make a case that it's it started... Uh, at the end of World War II, for that matter. It started then, you know. Everything else was kind of... After World War II, the, con the country flourished. The world flourished after all that devastation of World War II. But, I mean, it all started in the early 1900s. Anyway, I'm just saying, could be. Okay, so then verses 5 through 7. Uh, we call this a theophany, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. Most people aren't convinced it's Jesus. It could have been another angel, but I have a feeling it was Jesus. It 
Sandy, Jesus did say that, that at the end times, there'll, there'll be signs. You know, there will be signs, and we see all the signs. <laughs> They're all happening. They're all happening. The, the rebirth of Israel, Alan, the, the, you know, everything's... Look, let me put it this way. If Jesus came back tomorrow, we shouldn't be surprised. Because, okay, then people say, well, you know, the temple has to be rebuilt over there. Well, you know what? It doesn't have to be rebuilt before the, the, uh, before the rapture comes. It has to be rebuilt before uh, Jesus comes back to the earth. So after the rapture, there's going to be seven years at least. And who knows what could happen during that time. Someone will say, well, the gospel has to be preached to all the world before the end. Well, that's true. But we're close to it now, by the way. But after the rapture, what I think is, this is another one of my personal thoughts. Hey, Millie Cobbett. Um, I'm just telling you what's on my heart, what's on my spirit. Um, after the rapture happens, with all the technology in place, right? Internet, you know, whatever. Well, internet, basically. But radio, TV, you know, whatever. Cable. After the rapture takes place, I think the whole world, I mean, the whole world is going to be researching what just happened. And when these nations do that, they're going to come across this thing called the rapture of the saints. Oh, oh, that, oh, the gospel, Jesus, oh, I have a feeling after the rapture, a lot, a lot of people are going to be exposed to the gospel. Now, that does, doesn't mean they're going to accept it, but it doesn't say they're going to have to have to accept it. It says they will all have to hear it. So I think they're all going to hear it. That's my thought anyway. Can't prove it. Just my thought. Okay, so verses 5 through 7, a theophany. So Daniel looked, there were three, three what? Three beings. There was one talking with them, that was Gabriel. Gabriel, we think it was Gabriel, because he spoke in Daniel 9. Daniel, uh, Gabriel seems to be the messenger angel. And now there's two others with him, right? There stood two others with him, one on, the, one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And, and one, uh, the man clothed in linen, was above the waters on the river. So now you have one angel here, one angel there, and another being on top of the water. I think that's Jesus. Most people would say that's Jesus. And, and so Daniel cries out and he says, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? And uh, <laughs> verse number seven. Verse number seven is great. It says, I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to the heavens. He swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things will be finished. Translated, one, a time is a year, times is two years, half a time is half a year. So three and a half years. So in three and a half years, when... Um, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered. Paraphrase, when Israel breaks, when Israel finally yields and surrenders to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, all these things will be finished. At the end of the three, so the end of the three and a half years is the end of the seven year period. It's divided into, into two halves, three and a half and three and a half. The last three and a half is called the Great Tribulation. So after that, after that seven years or the second three and a half years, when the holy people are shattered. Now that, that, that means they're broken before God. They accept Jesus finally, which was the whole point of the seven year tribulation. The whole point of, of the tribulation time is, is for God to deal with Israel. Remember the this, this scenario. Yeah, Old Testament, it's all about Israel. Jesus comes, okay, from the day of Pentecost till, until the rapture, it's all about the Gentiles, called the church age. I mean, some Jews are getting saved, but it's, it's basically about the rest of the world. 
So Old Testament is basically all about Israel. New Testament, up until the rapture, is all about the Gentiles. Once the rapture happens, it's back to Israel again for those seven years. I learned that from Brother Siriano, and I, I, when he told me, I didn't really get it. I get it now. It makes perfect sense to me. God made a covenant with Abraham and Moses and David, and he will not uh, relinquish <clears throat> his promises to Israel. He wants, it, it, this is how faithful God is. Through, through Israel came Messiah. There's a special bond with, the, with Israel and God, and he will not relinquish or not, not disrupt that covenant, that promise he made with Israel. He will give them every chance to receive Messiah. So question, only from Israel have a second chance? Annie, that's a very good question. Uh, let, me, let me give you reference here. So 2 Thessalonians 2, it does talk about um, when the Antichrist comes during the, during the tribulation years, there will be a strong delusion so that those who have heard the gospel prior to will be deceived and will not accept it during that time. So your question is, only Israel has a second chance. There is something about that because, uh, as someone said, the two witnesses are out there, the 144,000 are out there proclaiming the word of God primarily to the Jews, but not only to the Jews. So I think, I think uh, the second chance question, I, I, I'm not settled on that. Second Thessalonians 2, I, I'm not settled on it because it seems out of the character of God to not allow people to have a second chance. What it may be, be referring to in, in 2 Thessalonians 2 is that for those people who hardened their heart against God in the first place, it, most likely they're going to keep their heart hardened to God even after the rapture because they'll be deceived. That's probably what that means. But as far as someone with a good soul and a, a I don't know, uh, it, it, it seems anti the anti-character of God to, to refuse people. But any, in any case, well, yeah, because, okay, let's say the rapture happens right now. So then there's going to be 144,000 Jews that preach the word of God at some point in the next seven years. So is that to say that they never heard about Jesus? I mean, it's 2022. I think every Jew, because most, most Jewish people live in developed countries, They've heard the gospel, they've heard of the gospel at least. And so, you know, that thing about the second chance, the, the Jews definitely will have another chance, obviously. But uh, about the Gentiles having another chance, I, I, I'm not clear on that yet. I can't say definitely, but I, I think they will unless they've already hardened their heart. But interestingly, in Revelation, when, you really stu when we studied it a few years ago on Wednesday nights, we found out even after all the judgments, all the calamities, all the wars, all the, everything's going on, there will still be multitudes of people that harden their heart against God. They still will not repent. And you think, what is the matter with these people? You know, Well, they're deceived. Now, does that mean everybody will be deceived? No, it can't be because we know there will be people who are saved during the tribulation. Will they be Jews? Yes. Will they be Gentiles? I would say yes, they would have to be. So good question. Uh, I need further study on that. Uh, right, Sandy, right. Good people. Uh, yeah, that's right. Good people does not mean save people. Uh, so, but are not a lot of good people not going to, a lot of good people are not going to heaven. Being good does not mean being saved. I mean, you could make a case for a lot of bad people are going to heaven because they repented and got right with God, but they're, you know, they have a reputation of being bad, but now they're cleansed, washed in the blood. Okay, can you see why this takes a long time? There's so much in here, you just can't, you just can't run through it. So anyway, um, verse number seven, Israel is left by herself finally uh, to deal with God and, 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 and the Lord... Uh, Oh, Tanya, 
Are you the young lady in uh, Pakistan, right? Good to see you again. God bless you. So, anyway, so so verse 7 kind of goes with, with verse number 1. Uh, Israel will be saved. This is what Paul addresses in Romans 9, 10, 9, 10, and 11. There is a special thing about Israel. You have to admit there's something special. And God, God, it's because of those promises that were made, you know, before. Okay, so verse number 8, Daniel says, Although I heard, I did not understand. And I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Let me, uh, let me go over to 1 Peter because I just want to say something about the prophets. I mean, you have to understand these prophets. They didn't know about Jesus. <laughs> you know, I and mean, we're looking back on it. It's like us looking at the future prophecies. You know, we don't know exactly how it's going to come down. But listen to what it says. There's one in 1 Peter and one in 2 Peter. But 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired, the prophets inquired, and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So the prophets, they were, like Daniel was saying these things, he didn't even know what he was saying. This was all new. This is like hot off the press, you know. And he, this has been revealed to him, and he, he's trying to figure it out, but he clearly does not understand it. Um, 2 Peter uh, 1, 19 and to 21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, so Daniel, yeah, he said, I don't understand. I mean, he's been saying that every vision he had. He said, I don't understand. Remember earlier, his reaction was he got sick. He was sick, sick. He was overwhelmed and, and uh, tired and sickly and just messed up because it really bothered him because he couldn't understand it. <clears throat> Ephesians 3, 8 through 10 says this. Ephesians 3, 8 through 10. To me, Paul, who am less than the least of all of the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now verse number 10 opens up a whole nother can of worms, not a can of worms, but a whole nother line of thought saying that the church is proclaiming prophecies Remember, knowledge is increasing. We're proclaiming things that Daniel couldn't even proclaim, right? So now it says uh, that they might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. I wonder, I mean, I don't know. I just wonder, okay, principalities and power. Now there's good principalities and powers and there's bad as in Ephesians 6. I just wonder if, if the church proclaiming these things, if the spiritual world is being educated, because they don't know. I don't, no, they don't know everything. 
that says the church is proclaiming so that uh, the principalities and powers that they may know. So yeah, so principalities and powers are learning from the church. So now you have a whole other thing where you ever wonder why some churches are getting attacked? Why some churches struggle? Why, why uh, Christian people struggle so much? Well, we're proclaiming the truth of God to the world around us, but in the process, we're proclaiming it to principalities and powers, and we could very easily be attacked by the enemy, which results in conflict or problems or discouragement or oppression or whatever. So yeah, all of that opens up a whole other door to think about. Because the closer you get to God, the, the, the stronger you proclaim the things of God, the more serious the attacks are as well. And that, that Ephesians 3.10, let me read it again. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Could it be that God is using the church to proclaim the message and in the process the angels and the fallen angels are hearing what's coming down the pike that is a powerful powerful uh verse of scripture that's ephesians 3 10 hey jesus how you doing my brother god bless you all right so i got two minutes to go here and uh you know just not gonna make it just not gonna make it. let me let me do verse number nine and it's, <laughs> verse number nine is where we were supposed to start tonight. But he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. And again, as in verse number four, the time of the end. Are we in the time of the end? If you ask me, I say, yes, we are. I think the time of the end really, really picked up in the early 1900s when Azusa Street happened, when revival broke out, when, 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 Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. Until then, so you take the early church, which was Pentecostal, all right? Gifts of the Spirit, baptism in the Spirit, Holy Ghost anointing and power, and everything going, going, going. Okay, first century, you know, continue. Second century, okay, from the second century on, third century, fourth, fifth, all the way through, dark ages, man, the Holy Spirit was basically buried. You have to realize the church had, had power, but not much. I mean, it, it survived, but there was a lot of corruption. You know, 1500s, 1600s. Well, 1400s were the, were the great years of exploration from Europe where America was discovered and 1500s, all these. That was a, a great awakening too, but... Um, you know, 1500s, 1600s, America, 1700s, America became a nation, 1800s, at the end of the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution, 1900s, boom, Azusa Street happens. I don't know. I, I really think some, there's something to that. And now with all the, as I said, all the technological advances, the internet, communication, education, um, everything's happening. We're in the time of the end. Knowledge is increasing. And so, yeah, all this is going to happen, and, and we're, we're getting ready for the rapture, church, is what I'm saying. We're getting ready for the rapture. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> it's funny, that's where we were going to start tonight. But we're going to stop right there. And uh, as my wife always says, we don't have to rush. And you know what? We're not rushing. Okay, Jesus, we are in a spiritual battle. The enemy only has the power that you choose to give him. He is already been defeated in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, amen and amen. That's right, that's right. Uh, I just want to encourage everyone, you know what? And we sing a song called, uh, uh, what's the name of it? I'm going to see a victory, I think the name of it is. Yeah, we, we have a victory. We have a victory. And I just want to encourage everyone, stand in your victory. Trials will come. Heartache will come. Headache will come. Stress will come. But stand in your victory. Plead the blood of Jesus over your situation, over your life, over your family. 
Uh, safeguard your home with the Word of God, with worship music. Uh, get rid of things that are ungodly and unholy and serve the living and true God. These are days to get ready. These are days to get ready. Um, so we're going to stop right there. I love this study of Daniel. I'm not sure where we're going to go uh, after Daniel. Um, I'm, I'm seeking the Lord on that. Annie, good to see you on here. Annie, I hope, hope that little discussion about your question was helpful for you. Uh, but 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about that deception that even those who heard the gospel before won't believe. Uh, that needs some expo exploration in my mind and spirit. I want to devote a lot of time to that. I just haven't been able to. Uh, <laughs> a study number. How about uh, uh, Lamentations or Leviticus? Uh, some of those books are known to be dry, but you know. Book of John, yeah. All right, well, I'm going to pray. Uh, Jesus, uh, we'd love to see you at church. We know you're busy, but uh, we think about you often. We keep you in our prayers. God bless Leaving the Streets Ministry. We see your good work on Facebook often. Uh, well, Revelation, we did Revelation, uh, Tony. I, 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 we could, but there's a whole lot other stuff to do. I mean, some of us remember that book of Revelation. Ephesians, we did Ephesians, actually, a few years ago. Uh, we, I'll tell you what we did. We started with Ephesians. Uh, was it Ephesians? Yeah, we started with Ephesians. Then we did First and Second Timothy because Timothy came to pastor the church of Ephesus. And then we did Revelation. Then we did Romans. Then we did, now we're doing Daniel. So we did, did, did six books. That took about six years, actually, to do. So, uh, you know, I, I'd like to get into a, a book we haven't done yet, but... Uh, well, I don't know if I'm ready for Revelation again. That book, whoo, that is something else. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be praying. You pray pray for me to know where to go, you know? I mean, I'm open for suggestions, but I want to I hear from God too, you know? All right, let's pray, and we're out of here. Father God, thank you for this night. Thank you for the fellowship. Uh, I want to pray your blessing, Lord, upon everyone on here. Uh, those that were commenting, as well as those that were not commenting. I see 20 people right now, so that's great. Uh, Lord, I pray that this was helpful for people. I pray that the Word of God will somehow work its way into our mind and spirit, into our body, into our being. And Lord, that your Word will li literally change us. Lord, I know your Word says in 1 John, what is it, chapter 3, I think it is, uh, where John says, if anyone has this hope in him, this hope of Christ's return, which is what we're talking about, they purify themselves just as he is pure. So Lord, I pray that as we study these end time events, that um, it, it won't just be head knowledge, it'll be spirit knowledge, which will result in holiness so, Lord, on that note, forgive us when we're not. Forgive us when we're not sanctified and holy. Forgive us when we're worldly. Um, and re as David said, Lord, renew a right spirit in us. So, anyway, Lord, thank you for tonight. May your blessing be upon the men's group tomorrow as our brother Tony shares the word. And on Friday as Pamela shares the word with the sisters. Lord, prepare us for a great day on Sunday. Lord, let the church be packed. I pray, let the church be packed. Let the praises go up and the blessings fall down and the word of God go forward. And let us know that we've been in the presence of a living God. So thank you, Lord, for this night. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen. I'm going to put on some music. If you want to write anything, you can. And then I'll try to uh, respond to you before I leave the office tonight. Thank you for joining us. Really do appreciate you joining us. It's, it's wonderful for you to be here. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Bye.